Good evening. The artist as critic and the critic as artist. Um, usually that's a, a theme of a symposium or a workshop. The, uh, tonight, uh, it's not a theme but a description of uh, Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe. Um, he works in both arenas, uh, actually works in both arenas. Uh, today there's many practicing artists and many practicing architects that, that cross over in uh, somewhat of a cursory way. Um, but Jeremy's uh, body of work is actually well represented in both arenas. And uh, working in both arenas, I think, gives him uh, quite a unique insight um, when he crosses over. Um, being a critic informs being an artist and vice versa. Uh, he's a painter, but he's also a critical theorist. His uh, paintings have been exhibited uh, quite extensively, both. Uh, in solo shows as well as group shows. And um, I know of a piece that's uh, currently outside a friend of mine's office at the Getty, uh, Julia Bloomfield. Um, his work has been uh, in many uh, journals. The critical work has been in many journals. And there's also a collected, uh, a book of collected essays, Imminence and Contradiction. Um, he's taught at Cal Arts. Uh, a number of my friends um, were there at the time and know him uh, quite well. He's currently teaching at, uh, on the graduate faculty at the Art Center in Pasadena. And recently, uh, he taught uh, with uh, Frank Geary in a, in a design studio uh, at Yale. Uh, Frank, has, through his own work and through his teaching, has been exploring, uh, in his case, a symbiotic relationship between uh, art and architecture. Um, most often, it's the adversarial relationship between art and architecture. I think it's uh, also quite unique that, that Jeremy was a part of that as well. Uh, tonight, Jeremy's talk is uh, titled Intersections. With that, I give you Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe. Well, um I'm going to talk about schizo culture, so it's kind of good to be introduced in terms of the multiple nature of my public personality or identity. Uh, when, when I was invited to speak here and, and told that my general subject was to be intersections, I immediately thought of the intersections in Khartoum, the capital city of the Sudan. These, uh, I am told, are in the shape of the Union Jack, the British flag. Having destroyed the town in 1898 in revenge for and humiliation there 13 years before, Lord Kitchener laid it out again in such a way as to intimidate the inhabitants each time they went outside. And at the same moment, I was also reminded of Louis Aragon, the surrealist and Marxist, recommending that all intersections and all windows be redesigned so that nothing ever met anything else in such a way as to make the sign of the cross or to cast the shadow of the cross. Aragon's position is the mirror image of Kitchener's, the one violently imposing an affirmation of the British Empire, the other violently imposing rejection, the one making the imperial idea present by enunciating it, the other the religious idea present in that which seeks to repress it. In both cases, Kitchener, the field marshal who invented the concentration camp, Aragon, the surrealist who became an apologist for Stalinism, one finds an almost postmodern insistence on the intersection as a sign, 
as a function which is most powerful as an icon. Aragon, when he raves about needing to abolish the window which has four panes of glass so as to avoid casting the shadow of the cross, thus reaffirming what one needs to escape as the intersections in Khartoum reaffirmed the presence of the oppressor, is perfectly willing to sacrifice logic and common sense, neither of which it is true, have a great deal of appeal to surrealism, to the elimination of an icon. One wonders whether a similar point might be made about postmodernism's desire to eliminate its influences. In both cases, too, one finds the intersection defined as a place of sharp angles, of geometrical convergences, which involve distinct changes of direction. And um, there, I think, is where one is, what begins to see a distinction, a sharp diversion, as it were, between the, in fact, modernist epoch of imperialism and surrealism and our own post-imperialist, post-surrealist period. One, perhaps, which may, in part, be defined as the continuation of imperialism and surrealism by other means. However that may be, I'm inclined to suggest, more or less seriously, that our period is one in which the intersection takes its characteristic identity from the freeway rather than from the street. The modernist intersection was mechanical. One stream of traffic stopped so that another could pass by. The postmodern freeway intersection is one of relative speeds. One stream of traffic speeds up in order to meet the other. Stopping means death. On the freeway, one is in the zone of pure traffic. Traffic which begins not with the pedestrian, but with the speeding car. One is, by definition, always between places rather than leaving or arriving at them. The freeway intersection is, uh, therefore, a transition within a transition. Quite unlike the cross, it is never seen except from the air which is itself an experience which slows down everything relative to the speed of the aircraft and making things seem stately. And recalling, perhaps, in that Wallace Stevens remark that from a certain distance, one might think that the fox was leading the hounds. The cross is known. Retracing it might make uh, Aragon feel oppressed, but for others, it marks out boundaries, the edge of postal zones, the start and finish of named streets. The freeway intersection is less clear. It requires one to turn right in order that one may turn left. And it takes place essentially nowhere between this and that exit, known from the free, from when seen from the ground as an on-ramp, as if to underscore the freeway's identity as a zone of pure locomotion. Most importantly, from the point of view of what I have to say here, the freeway is a condition of constant movement, a condition which I should compare to the electrical circuit, while the street intersection is, on the other hand, mechanical, a system in which one part stops while the other one goes. And as I've suggested, I suspect that one might want to call the one postmodern and the one modern but that is not particularly important uh, to what I have to say here. Now, like um, Prince Charles, I know virtually nothing about architecture. <laughs> Unlike him, I have good advisors, and I'm going to turn now to a remark made by one of them about the other. Speaking about Frank Gehry, Kurt Forster said to me, and I'm able to quote this at length because it's from a soon-to-be-published interview with him, uh, that, uh, quote, I think my spontaneous reaction to Gehry's buildings is a curious equivalent to the bodily actions that the architect employs to shape them. You want immediately to go and touch them. What is this? What is behind this? Is this hollow? Is this warm? Is this cold? 
is this really not a horizontal slab? The startling encounter between surfaces which are seemingly doing many of the same things, like a tile-clad facade next to a metal-clad facade, both means of giving volumetric assurance and closure, as well as impermeability to water, etc. When they stand side by side or curiously cut into each other, do indeed become what he says they are, objects in a still life. They are a setting within which the viewer visitor is the only agent who can possibly, as it were, ratify what has been done by the architect." End of quote. One would ask, remembering Nietzsche's admonition that the body thinks the world, what kind of a body is this architect's body whose functions are inscribed or reconvened in the trace of architectural thinking, which is the building? Going back to the freeway, some of you will recall Felix Guattari's decentered driver in his book Molecular Revolution. A driver doing one thing with his feet and another with his hands, to which one may add an active driver listening passively to the stereo, ears in quite another world than the eyes, reclining at 65 miles an hour, entirely public in an entirely private space. This is simply how things are for in what Guattari and his colleague uh, Gilles Deleuze call schizoculture. <laughs> and it suggests a thinking or an identity which is not fragmented so much as it is multiplicitous. Hence, uh, one supposes, a building whose facade could be made out of both tile and metal in circumstances where these two could, to quote Forster, curiously cut into one another. Such an architect would be, it seems to me, what the schizoculture in the form of the person on the freeway would require. It would be an architecture no longer concerned with building in the sense that one can build anything nowadays and the issue therefore cannot be said to be there in any kind of poetics of construction. This too, by the way, is an observation to which I am indebted to Kurt, for which I am indebted to Kurt uh, Vorster. Architecture would then be concerned with another question, not a question about building, but one of presentation and, through presentation, movement, both symbolically and practically. What Forster is describing when he talks about a facade made out of tile and metal which curiously cut into each other is two systems which interpenetrate. A facade which works, presents itself in terms of difference. Difference in the Deridian sense of two signs which differ but at the same time are able to defer to one another through, that is to say, their similarity. Two versions of what a facade may be perform this dance of deferral exactly, not by throwing what tile or metal is into doubt, but by offering a constant supplementing of the definition of each with regard to the idea of the facade. One is always, that is to say, something which the other is not. What is ratified by the viewer visitor is then an architecture presenting itself through a mobility made possible by an exercise of difference. I say a mobility because these facade materials have been described, you will recall, as cutting into each other's series, each other's continuity. If I um, may re refer to an actual building by Gary. You must be wondering how theoretical this is going to get. Um, one with which you are, I expect, um, all familiar, the Loyola Law School. Uh, I may perhaps make a further point of a similar sort. In the Loyola Law School, one has 
in the building seen in this photograph, a stairway which leads indirectly to an upper floor which itself contains a sort of glass house, an enclosed space which is nonetheless open to the outside, like a car. One is then led up the outside of the building to a part of the building which is in some sense still outside. The staircase itself comes out in order to go in, providing as it does that a kind of platform halfway up from which to look both back and down and up. A viewing platform distanced from that to which it is connected, which is also that of which it is itself a part. Returning then to Vorster's remark about these buildings returning one quote, to the bodily actions that the architect employs to shape them, I should ask what sort of shaping is proposed by this staircase and by its termination in a transparent shelter? Certainly one may say that the staircase involves several kinds of intersection with the building all describable in terms of bodily actions which, as actions, think the world, climbing, pausing, and as the staircase narrows towards the top, being squeezed. Furthermore, the staircase takes one not through the interior of the building, which was done by someone else and, done, and, and uninterestingly, so that if you actually go into the building, it's like go, going into the Taj Mahal and finding out that it was a bank. Um, but but um, up and down, it's, it's outside. As it does so, it takes one away from and back to the building, but another way of saying that is that it brings one, for a moment, closer to everything else. Closer to everything, that is to say, which faces the building but is not the building. As one climbs the staircase, one is led out into space, from which one may see, as they say, where one is, in order to be finally delivered at this interior, uh, which is, however, still an exterior. Movement is then arranged in such a way as to be digressive, and as with other famous staircases, is presented in terms which make one conscious of it as movement up into perspective defined as a narrowing, movement defined as convergence. As movement upwards, it is movement which takes place in relationship to a facade. It makes the facade present in a variety of ways. I climb away from it, I pause and look away from it before I turn back in order to proceed, I climb further in order to reach my goal, through a space which narrows as I ascend. Or, conversely, uh, going down, I am poured through a spout which creates a flow wider than its aperture, and am then turned back towards the building in order to then leave it. In either case, an elaborate dance is performed on and in front of an impassive facade. One might say, a facade invented to be impassive to be, perhaps, not a thing which is somewhere, but a place somewhere where something might take place. The staircase completes the building, but supplements the building's facade. Functionally, one has to have the staircase. To have that particular staircase is to add something to the meaning of the building, or more exactly, to the building's capacity to construct or release meaning, which capacity, and this is the point, is here deferred entirely into this supplement, the staircase. The staircase is elaborate in order that the facade may remain impassive. It is an impassivity which may be provoked into expression by climbing the staircase. The staircase intersects with the building by being separate from it, both uniting and separating, by defining the nature of the uniting, the building from the world, and it does so by defining movement in terms of compression and of the body which strives to look at itself. And not one notes at its interior, 
a body looking at its face rather than its soul, or if you like, at its Lacanian soul. A body which turns back on itself in order to leave, whose interiority is in practice presented as a transparency. If this is formalism, then it is a formalism which has very little to do with form. It is rather a formalism of digression, difference, meandering. A kind of formless formalism, in fact, which constantly invokes the body as both the medium through which to think the work, the body, in other words, as opposed to an essentially disembodied mind, and as a model for some, of some sort for the work. In either case, movement considered in terms of an entirely complete and present system, the body, as opposed to one which is by definition provisional and incomplete, like history, or its child, a, a rational theory of architecture, or art, or music, or anything else. One may say a formalism of formlessness, but it might be more accurate to say a presentation of multiplicities. One may contrast uh, Mies van der Rohe with Gary uh, in order to make a, an obvious point in, in this regard. In van der Rohe, one doesn't really find contortion as an important idea. In Gary, one does. My advisors, particularly Vorster, have long since disabused me of my idea that van der Rohe is some sort of extreme product of German philosophy, a person or point of view founded on the idea that light is good for you, that to be close to nature is to be close to truth, and that order liberates. But even with these provisos, or perhaps because of them, uh, one may, I think, describe van der Rohe as quite seriously committed to the grid. And that means to an order which does not meander, save in a way which may be pluralistic but not multiplicitous, in that one may only meander within the grid in order to be returned to the grid, which reaches out through all things, beginning in the building and extending to cover the world. In uh, this picture, of the Langer House in Krefeld, one sees the, the grid knitting things together even as it holds them apart. One notes that the figurative sculpture is placed on the lines of the grid rather than within the grid. The grid supports the figure as it joins the built to that which the constructed is not, which is nature, being as opposed to building. The viewer visitor, to preserve Vorster's terms to this site, would seem to be a very different kettle of fish, almost a pun in this context, to the one summoned up by one of Gary's buildings. I don't mean to overlook all that the two have in common, tautness at the level of the facade being perhaps one thing which is important, but the idea of the thinking subject the viewer visitor created by the viewing and visiting seems very different in the one than in the other. This would not, I think, be a difference between two uses of the grid, nor would it be a question of using the grid or not. It would involve, rather, some question having to do with what the grid represents before it, in its turn, becomes the armature of a series of representations. In van der Rohe, perhaps, uh, one finds a kind of Freudian grid, a system which unites inside and outside, provides a key from the outside to the outside, external behavior as a manifestation of an interior order, while uniting the outside to what it is not through reflection, a narcissism which begins to order the natural in terms derived from the built. Gary, on the other hand, might be thought of as a kind of Lacanian in terms of this comparison, aware of the grid as itself a device which represses as much as it reveals, and aware that all that is hidden takes place on the surface. 
that the language that the subject speaks constructs that subject, constructs what it conceals, constructs by way of concealing, is concealing as a construction, therefore conceals nothing. Or perhaps one might simply return to the difference between the on-ramp and the street corner, the elevated zone of movement and the pedestrian surface. The street is organized on a grid. Like a grid, it stops and starts. It invokes <coughs> the pedestrian, the walker, in that it is organized and organizes the world in steps of equal length. It covers the surface by way of sharp turns. Its principle is repetition, evenness, which allows one to know it as a stability and as an entirety which carries with it the principle of its own extension. The freeway may in some way be linked to a grid, ultimately a grid which covers the United States, but it is, I think, made out of different or ideas, or more properly, it makes different ideas, invents another kind of subject. It has no sharp turns, but instead substitutes the idea of flow for that of disjunction. One might compare this to the difference between film and video. It is, as we have said, tied to the image of the car in transit, neither arriving nor leaving, deferral actualized, as it were. On the freeway, I am neither here nor there. Similarly, perhaps, when one was halfway up the stairs at the Loyola Law School. Its principle is one of flow, but not of evenness, because it is based on different speeds, which are the speeds of objects, streams, actually which do not or must not intersect the circuit as opposed to the mechanism, the computer as opposed to the typewriter, the freeway as opposed to the street. All are principles of continuity, which are based on motion which is both constant and uninterrupted, rather than on a procedure of interruptions of stops and starts. I'm led to wonder how one should theorize such a principle in a larger sense. Is it a question which leads one back to those title tiles, those, that difference between the tile and the facade, similar but different, curious in the interpenetration of these two series, yet endlessly and irrevocably uh, different, producer of difference? Is this a question of a subject, an architecture, constructed in some way on an idea which is never one idea, which is to say, never a grid, but is rather a kind of zone in which different intensities impair, appear, phenomena one wants, to quote Forster again, to immediately go and touch, to ask, what is this? What is behind this? Is this hollow? Is this warm? Is this cold? Is this really not a horizontal slab? On the freeway, one speeds up and one slows down in an order of complete difference and similarity. In this description of what it is to respond to Gary, this is Ian Kerr's description, there is a series of questions about different kinds of things, all coterminal, none the same or part of the same system. It is a description then based on a kind of idea of the multiplicitous. <coughs> It suggests a unity of parallelism uh, rather than of interruption, of a series of currents rather than the grid. The intersection of differences which can never meet and which supplement one another without contradicting each other. The tile which neither cancels nor complements the metal, but supplements it in terms which also deny finality to that which is supplemented. In a similar sense, the right turn preceded by a right turn, which is really a left turn, providing freedom of movement for movements which must never meet, but which are, of course, complete in themselves. In a sense, that image which Aragon hated so much has been replaced by the image of the circuit, the chain where each link is not entirely a variant of the next, 
and is not connected to it, save as another element in the chain, whose speed, in Vorster's terms, its temperature, is not constant, but varies subtly from link to link. With what may we associate such an organization of differences? Differences which are differences between exteriors, like motor cars on the freeway. I should suggest that this is an image or a model or a figure of speech which may yield at least a couple of ideas which might be of interest to architects, might, that is to say, intersect with architecture in some way. One is that the freeway has created a new type based on evasion. A person, a culture, living on the outside of the suburbs, the exurban, working in one town which is not a town, going on the freeway to another town which is not a town to shop. A type which never goes downtown, which it demonizes, while destroying by its very existence the countryside, which it idealizes. This culture is an epiphenomenon, we hope, with regard to the culture at large, but it has curious resemblances elsewhere. Elsewhere, that is to say, in the kind of thinking which we've been discussing thus far. It is a form of organization which is, once again, based on intersecting by not intersecting, on the chain of different intensities, relays going in both directions and at different speeds. At a point where one can build anything, perhaps one is, perhaps one has in architecture, some version of a problem found in the other arts. The problem that the structure of the thing, the poem, the film, the painting, is in effect all that one has, and of course this would include the ability to obscure the structure, to engage it in an arbitrary reference or representation, etc., etc. But that structure finds itself nowadays as a concept in the intuition of intellectuals as well all too often as in the world, interested and engaged most of all in destructuring and supplementing the structure that the problem, or the problematics, lies uh, not with the mechanics of the thing as a thing, but with the thing as a sign, not mechanical, therefore, or as a sign system. It is thus that, the, um, that presentation would have to stand at some distance from construction, and would, through that distance, threaten to destroy the language of construction. One thinks of Deleuze again, briefly, with regard to his image of the nomad and the city as two possible kinds of thought. The city, growing like a tree, irreversible and centered. The nomad growing like a rhizome, a strawberry, endlessly decentering, endlessly turning back and in. The nomad lives in the space of myth rather than the space of history. The Afghanis just fought a war to keep history out of their country, to continue pathetically a life in which each generation does what the last does. The city is historical, most of all Christian, based on the principle of the narrative. Christianity grew up in cities an enthusiasm of the middle-level management of the secondary cities of the empire, to whom its frugality appealed. The word pagan means someone who lives in the country. Nomad thought as a social possibility seems horribly present in the exurban culture which destroys the country so that it may live in a myth of the country with no downtown and a great outdoors, but seems also to be one way of describing an architecture concerned with presentation and difference rather than construction and essence. Because that is, I think, where the problematics of structure would seem to lead nowadays. 
One has then, in the case of an architectural example like Frank's building, a positivity as a deconstruction of a kind of thinking which is elsewhere precisely not positive. And as to Christian thought, let me make um, a similarly obvious point. Kurt Vorster, to whom I've referred several times this evening, is currently on leave, pretending to have no contact with the outside world while he does some work. I imagine him, therefore, but for some unaccountable reason, as a monk who's taken leave of the monastery in order to live as a hermit for a while, perhaps in, shall we say, 500 AD. Only rarely does he venture forth from the appalling island in the North Sea to which he has retired, where he lives in a stone and wood hut and eats raw fish. When he does venture out, perhaps to get a skin to fix a hole in the shack, it is at low tide so that he may walk to the mainland. Once there, he would doubtless visit a crude version of this building, um, made um, similarly, but more cleverly and delicately as the materials allowed, as his own hut. And once there, even though he had walked across damp sand in the most awful rain and wind, it would be fair to say that he entered this organized grid which represented and embodied the organized church without in any significant sense experiencing change in any area or center of his body's intersection with the world. And as a fifth century monk, Kurt would of course, to some extent, be decentered in a way that one doesn't associate with modern man because he would believe that demons could inhabit him. But it is far more obvious that the contemporary subject, shall we say, architect or driver, the viewer visitor created or constructed by building or poems, is decentered in the sense that it is a subject conceived, as it were, from the first in terms of mobility alone, and not noticeably in the interests of unity. There are no changes in any significant intersection of anything with anything in the mind of the monk as he cheerfully takes on his uncomfortable trip to shore, to town, and finally to church, because he's always in the presence of God, a presence ordered for him once he gets to his destination. What is ordered in contemporary art, and perhaps this is true of architecture, is the idea of ordering and disordering. The problem of the complete as forces, it is a linguistic object, it is an historical object, it is a phenomenal object, one may make a trinity, is the problem of the thing's identity. And one may only work with that which one may identify. What is present to the contemporary subject are several quite irreconcilable readings of everything, which does not propose itself as everything, but as a conceivably successive array of differences, gaps or discrepancies between exteriors. A tile which defers to metal is a very different idea to that of the grid. In that difference, I think, is the difference between building and presenting between a language of essence and one of exteriors, of the intersection as the meeting of that which may neither meet nor, which should please Aragon but wouldn't, cross, of the subject as a nomadicized urban type, constructed at any moment by a variety of discourses, the radio, the traffic, distraction, attention, or, in the case of our architectural subject, the phenomenological, the linguistic, the historical as a stream, simultaneous but made up of rivalry. Of the building as a meeting of intersecting differences which are matters of attention, of addition, supplementation, rather than of subdivision, in which, as it were, the idea of the whole, the tree, is never really active, but where one has instead the idea of the building as nothing but a series of intersections and therefore 
as a series of series, of intersections with intersections. I end, uh, therefore, with this thought. The intersection itself intersects nothing, but instead marks, or in Aragon's terms, or Kitchener's certainly, commands. But it is perhaps a word which is itself unsuited to the task at hand. Perhaps that is the point, that the language of building must change in order to serve an architecture of presentation, just as painting has come to mean quite another thing, literally that, quite another thing in 1990 than it was in 1910. Perhaps that is the problem. That architecture, as with all the arts, is in some ways finding another way to intersect with the world in itself as an entity and as a past than one which is based on the model of intersection. Let that thought be the intersection with which I conclude, stem the flow, chop off the grid, intersect with the outside. Thank you very much. So we could have some questions, but we'd have to have light, because otherwise I shan't see who's... Am I familiar with Maya Deren's work? Was that the, 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 the filmmaker? Yeah. Sort of. No, I didn't know that. Very nice. Yeah, well, there you are, American surrealism. <clears throat> I shall add her to the list. It's good to have a woman as well as Eric on saying these things. Yes. Well, um, I, yes, uh, there are a couple of ideas there which um, perhaps ought to have been spelt out uh, a bit m more clearly. In Lacan, as opposed to Freud, you have this idea that, well, Freud treats the unconscious as if it was a real thing. It's not a real thing. It's something made of words. And in fact, one can theorize, and Lacan obviously has, the idea of the unconscious, not as this real thing spilling out through a sort of face, but as something constructed by the language which the subject speaks. Therefore, as something concealed which is actually carried about on the outside of the body and which, of course, I hasten to add, constructs the subject as much as being constructed by it, because Lacan is a structuralist, post-structuralist, and he's interested in this notion of the non-originary, and therefore as the subject as a kind of meeting of forces, rather than as a sort of Cartesian-centered, administered how. And then, another point I, I could have made um, here, which, which, which might have been helpful, would be um, one made very elegantly in, in the recent issue of Daedalus magazine by Gunther Auer, who is an historian of architecture at, I think, Cologne, <coughs> which is clearly one of the differences between an earlier kind of analysis and our own would be that it was once possible to think, or seemed possible to think, in terms of analysis which penetrated, which tore apart an exterior to get at an interior. Uh, Auer has returned to a, an image of Walter Benjamin's, uh, which is that indeed it is the case rather that the way that the sign veils itself is the sign. 
Benjamin is fond of the expression, or Gunther has quotes the expression, which is apparently a German one, the uh, veil, the cowl, does not hide the nun. That is to say, this veiling advertises what is in fact concealed by this veiling. So once again, one would have the notion of an exterior which signified, rather than the idea of an exterior which could be torn away to get at some interior. Hence, a um, analysis or way of thinking, or however you want to put this, all of them will be wrong, all of them will be imperfect, all will defer to some other way. A way of thinking which thinks with exteriors, rather than constructing, imagining, interpreting for itself an interior, a, a dogma of, of, or doctrine or discourse of, of essence. Well, but you see, I'm, say, I, I, I'm saying that it, it displays the idea of concealment, that it presents, it is a sign which works through the idea of concealment rather than openness. And one of the things that language, or the, therefore the sign, uh, are able to do is, of course, do that to make equivalent these two possibilities, which elsewhere have all sorts of connotations which we have to interpret and tend to treat allegorically and so on and so forth. But that is what I'm saying, yes, that we can think of the sign as, as if we think of the sign as a sign rather than as a sort of real thing, then we can think of the sign as this inhumanity rather than this humanity, and therefore as a sort of monster which can deploy, like a film star or something. Um, dishonesty as well as honesty, concealment as well as openness. These are all simply fashion statements available to the sign. This is, this is the way we, we begin to think about it once we stop confusing it with a real thing. There's more water. Have we reached the end of discourse, or is there, there there's some hand waving that I can't see? Thanks a lot.